violence, by white supremacy? Daniel Hill says the answer to that question is yes. Let's talk about it on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. And we are so glad you're here. I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. <laughs> uh, and uh, our resident megachurch pastor, Zach Van Dyke, is here. Zach remembers his appointments, his kids' birthdays. Now, if he could just remember to take his mask with him when he leaves the house. That's true. So many times I've gotten like a mile down the road and had to... <laughs> Zach and I had lunch yesterday, and both of us had to grab it and remember to put it on, or they wouldn't have fed us uh, in the restaurant. It's quite insensitive not to wear a mask. <laughs> Matthew Porter's with us, and judging by how he was dressed yesterday, I think he's ready for fall, right? Well, listen, the temperature here in Orlando dropped to a brisk 85 degrees. So I went to the closet. I went straight to the lumberjack section of my closet. Put on the flannel. I'm ready. Let's do it. I'm wearing a sweater today, man. Yeah. You know, Turn sweater weather. Out. Keep out yet, but I will. Uh, but I'm also going to swim this afternoon. So it isn't absolutely that cold. Our producer, Jinx, is working hard in this little glass booth. Jinx just dropped a new album. Fortunately, it didn't break. <laughs> and our video director, John Myers, is in his tech bunker. John wants the person who lost their iPhone 11 to please stop calling him on his new phone. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> He's not worry. saying anything. I read <laughs> Allegedly. Dr. George Bingham is the president of Key Life. George says our ministry would be solid financially if Matthew Porter, our executive producer, would just settle up with the Key Life snacking honor system. <laughs> you guys know about that? Speaking. <laughs> I thought that was a, I didn't know. Okay. Yeah, just just your own little secret there. <laughs> and Kathy Wyatt the chips is, of are course, in. here. I'm sorry. What was I, that? I was just commenting on the chips and the chips that he owes us. The chips are down. <laughs> Did you know yeah. those were the orphan's chips? It's big bucks. And Kathy Wyatt is the soft feminine side of the program. Kathy, that's a... Uh, Really beautiful blue microphone, and it just looks wonderful <laughs> with your outfit. Thank you so much. And thank it's you especially only. to Matthew, who, who we shared. traded microphones. Just we, shared my, we did. We traded. And <laughs> it was very gracious of you because you were the only one. I think you had the blue one because you're the executive producer, but you gave it to me. And so I'm very happy. Nice. Well, this matches my heart better. So and it probably has <laughs> Cheetos dust on it. <laughs> and the rest of us have black microphones. That's probably a sign of white supremacy oh, uh, at best and racism at worst. But Kathy is cool with her blue microphone. I have blue. I don't know what that means, but I have blue. <laughs> Daniel Hill, uh, by the way, and he's been with us before, is the founding and senior pastor of River City Community Church, a vibrant multi-ethnic church in Humboldt Park neighborhood of Chicago. He's the author of 1010 Life to the Fullest and White Awake, an honest look at what it means to be white. Daniel's newest book, which I now hold in my nicotine-stained fingers, <laughs> is called White Lies, Nine Ways to Expose and Resist the Racial Systems that Divide Us. Daniel, I've been uh, reading your book this morning, and I absolutely love your heart. <laughs> But I'm, uh, and I've said this often, I'm so conservative, I think Rush Limbaugh is a communist. 
And for years, Tony Cambolo and I have debated issues. And for a year of those years, we did it on national television. And we took our time to do it because uh, we wanted to demonstrate how brothers uh, could love each other and disagree on a lot of issues. And the comment we got from all over the country, which showed that our goal was fulfilled, was you guys really do love each other, don't you? And we really do. And by the way, Tony had a major stroke recently. Mm -hmm. If you think of it, do remember him in prayer. I talked to him last week. At first, we thought he was going to die. But... He's gradually started improving and even started working, producing more of his wacko political views. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, Daniel, I've been reading your book, and you and I would disagree on something about systemic racism, for instance. I believe there's a class struggle, and it has more to do with that than race. But I'm not here as a polemicist in order to divide. As a matter of fact, you say some really, really good things in this book. And we've got to learn how to do what your goal is or we're going to be in serious trouble. Listen, I know you've told us before, but Daniel, would you, um, because it's funny and it... (laughs) And it's insightful. Tell us um, your initial efforts at forming a multiracial church and the monumental failure that took place because of that. Um, yeah, that was that would have been back in the late 1990s. And I was working at Willow Creek, which was uh, one of the largest uh, evangelical mega churches in the country. And I was kind of experiencing this racial awakening and seeing just how problematic the system of race is and wanted to do something about it. And there at that time wasn't a lot of room within the kind of Willow structure. So they um, kind of gave me permission to start a little campus satellite thing, downtown Chicago. Um, And so that was a big part of my uh, desire was to build a multi-ethnic community uh, to address this problem of race, be justice oriented. And um, yeah, it was kind of a shock to me. I thought that all that was missing was somebody would be talking about it and care about it and work towards it. But um, as you well know, it grew quickly, but it was a hundred percent white and um, all, all ur- white urban dwellers that agreed with me that we should be concerned about this. And uh, um, so I, I, I came to discover that just because the light bulb had turned on and just because I had become concerned about this, that was, that was not to be equated with having kind of a deep understanding of, you know, how deep the roots of this go and what kind of efforts are required to really address it in a meaningful way. Is that the <laughs> monumental the failure? mother who straightened you out, wasn't it? Oh, do you want me to tell that story? Is that, is yeah, that the one you're going to Oh, story? no, not that one. I've, 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 uh, I've screened out anything. I'm not sure I ever called it a monumental failure, but I appreciate your commentary on it. So, uh, I'll, I'll, <laughs> uh, yeah, in my efforts to try to understand what I was missing, one of the gatekeeper pastors in Chicago set up a meeting with some kind of key pastors, one white, one black, one Latino, one Asian. Um, and I shared my vision for what I was trying to do. And so, um, the Puerto Rican pastor went first and he said, um, you seem like you have a good good heart, but everything you're saying is so paternalistic. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Um, up until that point, I had never heard the word paternalistic before. I wasn't sure if it was a compliment or an insult, um, (laughs) quickly became clear which one it was. Um, the Asian pastor went second. He said, you keep talking about multi-ethnic multicultural ministry, but everything you talked about was black and white. I wonder if you even understand how wide the diaspora of different Asian countries is and how different the experiences are. And do you really have any idea what you're even talking about when you talk about multicultural? Uh, The white pastor was in an inner city neighborhood, you know, doing, it was well known for this. And he said, if I had a dollar for every white pastor who came in to save the city, I'd be a rich man right now. I'd be amazed if you're still here in five years. Mm. And then the black pastor said, um, it sounds noble what you're doing, but even if you did find your way, black folks are never going to go to a church in Chicago. We're way too racially segregated. They're never going to go to a church led by white pastors. So you'd be better off for your own self and everybody else. I just cut it short now. So that (laughs) that was my big pep talk. Um, That was probably very good for you, wasn't it? It was. It was. It completely, completely restructured the way I was thinking about this stuff. All right. Let's start with the popular term, and it comes up all the time, 
uh, in conversations about race. Woke. What does woke mean? And I kind of felt like you'd be in favor of woke, but you turned out to surprise me. So talk to us some about that. I feel like there's, you know, we've got to be careful generalizations, but there's two like big problems that we're facing in the white community in particular. One is a group that's dug in that won't acknowledge um, that race is a problem. You, know, you, you potentially champion that group. So we can talk more about that. Uh, um, uh, and then there's a different group that like, suddenly has this sense of like, it's a problem. And then they declare themselves as woke and then try to position themselves ourselves as the ones who kind of get it and are going to bring solutions to it. And so I think each kind of group uh, represents a different kind of a challenge, but the woke group represents a challenge because the whole notion of being woke is like steeped in pride. It's the sense that I've arrived, that I get it, that I'm one of the good guys and uh, I'm going to be the ones to kind of fix this thing. Mm. Guys, you don't want to miss a bit of this. Uh, Daniel's book, It's White Lies, Nine Ways to Expose and Resist the Racial Systems that Divide Us. Unless you're living on Mars, you know we are divided and you know we've got some serious problems. Daniel and I might disagree on some of the solutions, but our heart's in the same place. Gotta do something gotta fix it and we'll talk about it on the other side of the break meanwhile this is very hard work and we gotta rest see you then Listening to Steve Brown, etc., and our guest is pastor and author Daniel Hill, whom we like a lot. His book is called <laughs> White Lies Nine Ways to Expose and Resist the Racial Systems That Divide Us. Daniel, I wanted to ask you about another word that you you touch on um, early in the book, which is it's another one like woke, where you kind of you think you know where you would fall on this word. But it's it's a little counterintuitive where you come out with it, and it's diversity. And that's one of those things. It's almost like happiness. You're like, yes, we want this, but you don't do do you get at it by going right after it? And so I wonder if you could delve into that a little bit. Um, the kind of uh, the tricky nature of uh, uh, extolling diversity. What's what's the problem with what's the double edged sword with that? Well, so I think one of the most important things in the journey for a white person, also for a white church or a white community, um, when we begin to open our eyes, just how deep the problem of race is, how deep the problem of white supremacy is, um, we need to be actually be certain we're seeing what the problem is, and what the problem isn't. And so what typically happens, and this is actually true at an individual level, it's certainly true at a church level, when the light bulb first turns on, when a white church realizes, holy cow, we're actually totally white, right? And like there's the occasional white person, but our whole staff is white, our whole leadership team is white, almost everybody who comes is white. Um, the typical kind of next step is to say, well, that's problematic that we're segregated. And so we need to become more diverse. And so rather than diversity becoming a means to an end, diversity becomes an end into itself, which I think is what you're referring to, Matthew, right? And so we right. figure if we could move from 100% white to something that feels more diverse, 80% white or something like that, um, that will just make us feel a lot better that we've done something significant to address the problem of race, to, drop, to address the problems of white supremacy, rather than asking how have we been in an all white church the whole time? And why is it that it's never been friendly to other kind of people? Why is it that the way we talk about the Bible, the way we worship, the way we do things isn't relevant to communities outside of white folks. That's almost never the question that's asked. The question that's asked is how do we get more non-white people into the exact same environment that already exists? Um, and therefore diversity becomes dangerous then because what people of color tend to hear when you talk about diversity is that you're ready to have racial conversations but when they discover that you never actually were wanting to have conversations about race. You just wanted more people of different backgrounds to come. It actually does more damage to the movement than it does positivity to it. It almost feels like it's like the woke thing. You're like, look, I want to be in the right spot. I want right. to be perceived as, is as, as right. being involved in the right things. And as soon as I can get the, woke merit badge as soon as i can get the right. diversity merit badge that's right that's right i'm gonna feel a lot better that's and right. even if it's 
good intentions, it's still a form of kind of posturing, it feels like, and it misses the heart of what's in play. Right. I think that's one version of it. It's a posture. And I think that's for sure real. Sometimes it's just, just sheer blindness, right? It's like, mm. it's a lack of understanding what the actual problem is. Right. So we just misdiagnose. Like it's, you know, usually the first thing I hear somebody say is they'll use Martin Luther King Jr.'s quote that you know, 11 o'clock on Sunday is the most segregated hour of the week. Right. So you say, if that's the problem, that 11 o'clock is the most segregated hour of the week, then the answer must be that not be segregated, be diverse. Right. But of course, when he said that, that's not what he was saying is that the lack of diversity is the problem. He's saying that's the fruit of the problem of white supremacy. Like the problem is white supremacy and the fruit of that is the ongoing segregation that happens. So at the most base level, we're addressing the symptoms and not the actual problem. And, uh, of course, diversity is very powerful if you're ready to address the problem, but when diversity is seen as the problem or lack of diversity is seen as the problem, presence of diversity is seen as the solution, then we've just glided right past the actual root problem. That's so profound. I wonder, George? Yeah, uh, Daniel, uh, and maybe this gets to another kind of a term, a terminology that would might be helpful to, to talk about uh, the structural or systemic uh, racism. You, um, you talk about at one point, you know, when, when the Christians perhaps in particular, you know, uh, want to begin to address the potential problem or the problem they see or whatever, they tend to look at, at the heart, you know, kind of their individual heart and think it's a heart problem. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, repent, pray, whatever, go on from there. Uh, but in arguing that, that it's more of a systemic or structural problem, and I don't, I hope I'm not disjointed. There were so many points I was interested in that, but, uh, you pointed out a study where, um, uh, researchers found that, um, people of color in a predominantly uh, uh, minority church or, or black church, uh, something like three quarters of them uh, recognized uh, race as a structural problem. When um, you went to multi-ethnic churches, that is where people of color were in a multi-ethnic church, then suddenly it was only like half of them thought it was a structural problem. And I guess the researchers concluded that there was actually a structural influence from the multi-ethnic church that was influencing the people of color in terms of their view of what the, uh, the structural racism. So I guess with all that, and I haven't, I don't know if we've left enough time in the segment, but uh, if you could just talk about the, the term structural and then uh, address that issue of, you know, maybe specifically related to that particular research, if you recall that from your book. Yeah, we'll do, try it in about 90 seconds, cover a few okay. different things. Like the, the, the problem of race at its core, and this is why I believe it's such a biblically imperative issue. The problem with race, the system of race is that it's built on a lie. It's built on a lie that says human value does not come from the Imago Dei, which of course is the cornerstone of Christian belief. Instead, that human value comes from where you were divinely put on this racial hierarchy and describes superior value to whiteness, inferior value to blackness, and then measures everybody else in between those two. And so it's that lie that I think we're up against on every front. So I would never want to minimize the importance of the heart change, the internal, but like that lie is told every day in a thousand different ways in our society. So this isn't about saying who's racist and who's not racist. It's about saying Jesus is truth. The devil's a liar. How do I contend with these lies? So I should contend it within my own heart. But if that's true, that there's these kind of lies being exported into our society every day, then it's not just a heart problem. It's also in systems, right? So if you build a school on a system, on a lie that says white people are inherently more human, more intelligent, more capable, black students are inherently less capable, less intelligent, less human, there's going to be for sure measurable implications to the expression of that lie in the school. And you go system by system by system. It just goes without saying that if the devil's a liar, it creates chaos and death and division. And so anywhere that lie exists, there's going to be a contest happening between the devil and Jesus. And so, yes, we should attend to it in our own hearts, but we should also attend to it in every structural society, trusting that Jesus was truth is trying to address the lie. 
you may want to come back to that next segment. That's the research. You, the only thing I would have added to what you said, it was, um, it's not just multi-ethnic churches, it's white led multi-ethnic churches that huh. historically systemically white folks don't tend to see the lie in the systemic ways in the way that black folks for sure, but you know, those who are proximate to blackness. And so when people of color are immersed in white led spaces, even if that white led spread is diverse, they tend to adopt the white framework of minimizing the impact of the lie. Mm-hmm. Too often, I believe that uh, those, especially to the left, who try to fix this problem, it becomes extremely paternalistic. And I don't know, because I'm not and can't know, but if I were black, I would find that very offensive. Uh, That black students need help because they're not smart, like white students, would drive me nuts. But then a lot of things drive me nuts. I'm old and I'm irritated about that. (laughs) Hey, since I'm old, I need to take a nap, but we're gonna return. Thanks for joining us on Steve Brown, etc. We're uh, hanging out with Daniel Hill. You can find out more from him at PastorDanielHill.com. And uh, you can follow him on Twitter at DanielHill1336. Uh, Daniel, we, we were talking about, uh, and I had referenced and you had clarified a, a study where um, uh, I guess black folks in particular attending a white led multi-ethnic church, uh, had a, a smaller percentage of them, uh, interpreted, um, structural problems of racism, um, as compared to those in a, a, uh, all or mostly black church. And it, and you were commenting on that and the influence of, of the structural, uh, component influencing their opinion. And maybe if I could kind of extend the question, uh, without being greedy with my time here, um, would that be, uh, relate to, for example, you, you see, um, black commentators and other commentators of color, who uh, who would disagree with the presence of structural racism? Would you say that they are being compromised in the same way by the structural uh, white supremacy? I, I would say that's just more an acknowledgement of white power. Like the voices that disagree with the structural racism are so few and far between in the black community. Um, but when white folks who are kind of committed to that message want to get that out, that's going to be the most natural thing they'll do is find the few and far between that have that view. And so th- those, you know, the Candace Owens, for instance, like she's just not representative of what you'd hear in almost any black church, you know, in any city across America. So it doesn't take away from her humanity or value or she's entitled to her own opinion. I just think it's not, it's not representative at all of like what you would typically hear in a black space. And so I think that speaks more to just, the kind of agenda that a lot of people have, you know, to get particular messages out and to use whatever messengers they can find to help solidify that message. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Daniel, I, I would love just your thoughts. Um, you know, and this, I feel like this happened the last time we were in a election season. Um, but to even talk about some of this stuff, um, get so, uh, it can get so confusing as to what's actually, especially in church, what's actually being said as being like, this is, this is biblical, or this is, you know, the heart of God as, as, as we best understand it from, from our understanding of the Bible. And then piling on top of that, all the political rhetoric that people are filling their minds with all week. So sometimes you say something that's, that's purely biblical, but then they associate all this other, you know, garbage that they're hearing. I'm just wondering as a pastor, like how do you navigate sticking to teaching what the Bible says, um, which has implications for our politics, but, but you aren't necessarily making a political statement. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, it's not easy even when it's done well. And I'm not saying I do it well. I mean, it's, it's, we're all preconditioned in certain kind of ways by whichever news outlet we listen to or whatever kind of environment we grew up in. So different things trigger different folks. But I mean, I, I try like, to me, the baseline theological principle is the Imago Dei, right? The Latin phrase for the image of God, that Genesis 1, 26, 27 idea that all human beings are created in the image and likeness of God, male and female. Right. And so I, to me, that's a non-negotiable kind of biblical stand starting point is that, what God cares most about in the universe is human beings. Like they're the ones that most uniquely reflect God's image. Right. And so that anything that assaults the Imago Dei is problematic, you know, for somebody who's going to follow Jesus. And then I think we just have to be honest about the fact that like different parties are going to highlight different parts of the Imago Dei <laughs> that are being attacked or are going to have different ideas for how to do about that. And then it does become political at that point. But in my mind, there should be some non-negotiables like should the Imago Dei of unborn be, you know, a starting point? Absolutely. Should the Imago Dei of people who are, um, threatened by the system of race be a certain point. Absolutely. Now, can you have different political views about what to do? Sure. You can have totally different, but we can have good, but that shouldn't be negotiable that the Imago Dei can be assaulted. And so like, that's one of the ways we talk about our church. We said, we will never be partisan. We will never tie faith to Republicans or Democrats, but we'll always talk about the Imago Dei being affected in society. It's a biblical issue, not a political issue. Mm-hmm. That doesn't like simplify. It doesn't totally cure everything, but at least mm-hmm. like that's the common thread between all the conversations is anytime the Imago Dei, is us under salt. That's a problem for those who follow Jesus because human beings are what God treasures most in the universe. You, can I, you ever, can I, can I follow up, Steve? Can I follow up? I'm just wondering, I, I love that. And, and that makes so much sense, but how have you found that people say, Oh, but of course, but then the minute you apply it yeah. uh, to something that they feel differently about, uh, have you seen them shift in their views? Or when they- well, I mean, when, when I'm in religiously conservative kind of environments, I just have to, I, I like literally use language. Like you have to, you have to understand like a psychic break happened for you somewhere. When, when there's a sanctity of life Sunday, where we talk, about how the unborn are under attack, you say amen all day, and there's nothing threatening about that. When we talk about how because of the system of racism, black people especially, but all people of color are under assault, you've been conditioned to not have the same response that you do to sanctity of life Sunday. Instead, you say, that's a political issue. That's a social issue. Why are you bringing it to the pulpit? It's like, wait, but last Sunday we did sanctity of life Sunday for the unborn. Like, this is the exact same, this is the exact same starting point. But there's no question that in every Christian conservative environment, they're going to be able to hear the first one because they've been kind of taught that that's okay. And then they're going to hear the second one. They're going to instinctively respond to it as a political social justice issue. You know, it could be in the second incidence, you have become political in a way there is legitimate disagreement, you think? <laughs> you don't, you're just not going to answer that, are you, Dan? <laughs> on the clock. And you should. Listen, seconds. we got to leave. Doesn't have enough answer time. It on the other side of the break. I wasn't watching the clock. Uh, now I am, and that means <laughs> that we're going to take a break. We're going to make a buck. We're going to rest up, and like Jesus, we're going to come back. Listening to Steve Brown, etc. And by the way, have you claimed your copy of the new Key Life Digital Magazine? You can go to keylife.org slash digital magazine now and you can download it for free. We're hanging out with Daniel Hill, and the name of his book is White Lies Nine Ways to Expose and Resist the Racial Systems that Divide Us. Um Daniel, I ask you a question and wasn't watching the clock and you were being obedient to our (laughs) video director by keeping quiet. And I thought I was just so profound that you were speechless. Let me rephrase the question and add a little bit more to it and then give you a chance to respond. One of my fears is, and as you know, I'm very conservative and, uh, have a major concern with racism and the divisions that are going on in the church. That's one of the reasons I love you. But you and I would disagree on the narrative. 
and it and we've got to find a place to talk to um and and sometimes when somebody uh goes against the narrative that you believe it could be they're making some good points. Would you agree with that or disagree? When you say the narrative, which narrative are you referring to that you disagree well, with me on? I think you have a narrative of things like systemic racism. Um, I think you have a narrative, even though you don't like the word woke, that has those overtones to it that now you understand. And, and I don't say that in a negative way. And as a conservative, I would see the, along with a number of black conservatives, by the way, I would see the problems as real, but I also say there's stuff behind it that's a lot more real than that. And that some of this has a religious base to it because there's no redemption, that we have a tendency to believe that Total depravity stops outside the door of African Americans or Asians, or that there are not systemic problems if there is that in the white community, in the black community. And I think those kinds of things have to be said or we don't really talk. I mean, as you know, in the book, um, I, what I'm trying to say that I believe it is at the very core of the problem of race is a lie uh, that's been with us since the very beginning that assigns superior value and inferior value, and that that lie is of the evil one and represents a direct assault on God's mind day. And I agree with that. Uh, so I guess if we can agree there, um, to me, that's the core, that's the core kind of agreement of like, what are we like, how real is that lie? Well, and let me just st st state this for, for what I think is fact for you to say you're super conservative and that you agree with that. That's actually awesome. Most Christian conservatives can't agree with that without, um, a tremendous amount of kind of internal dissonance that they're going to have to overcome. So that's not actually insignificant that you're saying you agree with that because that's not a starting point for most conservative Christians. Well, you might be surprised, but I think there are an increasing number of conservatives who share your concerns, but feel that I agree your with solutions. That. Hmm? I agree. I agree. The number's growing, but it's still small. Uh, and it, it, that's even before you get to the solution side. Well, that's a part of the narrative too. You know that you conservatives are racist, and and you start from the wrong place, and. You know, as a conservative, I resent that. And I have to say that. And I wouldn't be honest with you if I didn't say it. There's another narrative that says that you are shallow and superficial and nothing's going to get fixed until you see it my way. And, of course, both of those are wrong and we've got to talk about it. So, I, I, you know, I'm not that's not a put down of you. I very much appreciate what you're doing and your art and the success that you've had with understanding the lies and what they say. I just we we need to live closer together so we can sit down and you can have a beer and I'll have a Coke because I'm a teetotaler, of course, being a conservative. And we could talk about these well, issues. I'm, I'm a conservative too, so we're not even coming from different starting points. I mean, my starting point is <laughs> I mean, I grew up in a, I've grew up under a famous evangelical pastor scholar. Like this has always been my starting point is supremacy of Christ and authority of Scripture and having high views. So I mean, I, I'm theologically conservative too. I, I I think that there's something you're glossing over here, and that there's a lot of conservatives who are actively promoting some of the stuff that's problematic. Um, and so you may also be right that there's what you're calling narratives that depict them in a certain kind of a way that makes them defensive or they don't agree with the solutions. I'm not saying that's not true too, but that's one of our problems in America right now is that conservatives are as in large parts of the conservative Christian church are advancing these narratives and these lies without even always realizing that they are. And so I don't think we can lose that even as we say that there's a separate narrative that you kind of buck against that you don't like it, how that positions conservatives. Well, I agree. I, I think there's some truth to that. As long as you see the truth that there are a lot mm -hmm. of liberals, elites, 
I mean, that's not, White that's not my solution. And Rick, yeah. who yeah. were using things like Black yeah. Lives Matter and yeah. a lot of other movements to achieve their own goals. Yeah, I don't disagree. Because that's a human proclivity. It happens all the time. And yeah. we don't, as Christians, um, deal with these issues if we pretend they're not there. Yeah, I agree. But I, I think challenging the complicity in conservative circles, the, the, that, what that's not saying is you should therefore become liberal or therefore you should become Democrat or something like well, that. Well, you it's can challenge saying, the complicity in liberal circles, too. Yeah, and it's a different kind of and say there's it's, it's a, a different conversation there on the yeah, part I don't think of any most question. people. Well, if you talk to most black folks in my church, they they're always trying to figure out which one is harder for them. The white conservative who just doesn't believe it's a problem or the white liberal who paternally thinks they know the answers to it. Right. It's just a different set of problems that each one represents. OK, so you're right. There's so complicity on both sides that. of that. Yeah, we could so hold hands think, and walk what's, what's off into the sunset together. What's concerning, that. though, to, what's concerning to me about the conservative version of that is like our starting point is that truth is what matters. And so when we can't have conversations about how race formed, how it plays out, what the lies that are underneath, when we can't even have that like basic kind of conversation of truth. Like, I think that compromises us in a way that's different, that's unique. I'm not, I, I, I think that liberals have all kinds of problems. Again, and, that's not my solution is that we need to become liberal. Okay, Daniel, I hear what you're I really do honestly hear what you're saying. But you just said that conservatives believe that truth doesn't matter. And no, that it, I find that matter. irritating. No, I'm saying it does matter. But when it comes to this subject, they can't. To use my early illustration of contrasting Sanctity of Life Sunday versus talking about the problem of racism, like truth matters on Sanctity of Life Sunday. But like just having a basic conversation, like you said, you agree that there's a lie under it. Like something as basic as that will rip apart the typical white church if you try to have a serious conversation on that. Not getting into what should we do about it, not tying it to political parties, just that conversation around the existence of lies. Daniel, we've got to have you back. (laughs) <laughs> I'd love to. Uh, I mean, we really do. And I, I honestly didn't mean to get into all this in this final segment because there were others that important. had things to say more yeah. profound than I. But I say it with kindness. You're wrong and I'm right. And I'll pray <laughs> for you. I appreciate the kindness of <laughs> what you say that. <laughs> By the way, this book, and it is a book you ought to get and you ought to discuss in your church because this has got to be discussed. White Lies, uh, Nine Ways to Expose and Resist the Racial Systems that Divide Us. so good to have you with us during this hour. Obviously, we only scratched the surface. And uh, so we're going to have Daniel back sometime and we'll yell at each other for the first half hour and love each other for the second half hour. That's what Tony Campolo and I did for a long time. I do think that within the body of Christ, you know, there are certain political views you can't express with some friends because they will defriend you immediately. I've had that happen to me twice, and I wince when it does happen. That should never be true in the body of Christ. We, we need to start with if your heart is like my heart, if your basic beliefs are biblical the way mine are, From there on, we can be honest and we can talk. Um, One of the things about a lot that's going on is that it has religious overtones to it, Uh, secular religion. And if your religion has no room for redemption and forgiveness and repentance, then your only option is you got to be right and everybody else has got to be wrong. But we'll address that some other time. Right now, I hope, Kathy, that you have somebody on for next week who's nice, who agrees with everything I say, and who will smile even at my bad jokes. 
I was just going to say he was nice. You were the one that was getting a little questionable. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's yeah, true. but as you know, I was a lot. Uh, I you could were have been a lot worse. Yes, you were. You did. You were very. You did. Yeah. Anyway, enough said. So next week, good dog. Yeah. <laughs> good job. Next week, everybody's excited about next week because our our guest is Gina Delfonso, which none of us have heard of, but she has this marvelous book titled Dorothy and Jack, The Transform a Transforming Friendship of Dorothy Sayers and C.S. Lewis. Oh um, gosh, you don't so know. I've been reading that. This is gonna book be and- exciting. By the way, Zach, I forgot to give you this book when you were here yesterday, so I sent it to you in the mail. You should get it the next You'll love days. it. It's a great wait. book. <laughs> Um, I could be sing. Fun. We could have a hymn sing. No, we still no, have no. about five seconds. No, we don't. I surrender all. No. Let's hold hands, guys. <laughs> we're done. Just as I am. Guys, we Just really are done. Thank but you. we're going to come back next week, same time, same place. Hope you join us. Between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. <laughs>